Welcome YouTube, this is The Bucket bringing you my Viz 35, also known as the P35P, or as most people refer to it, the Polish Radom. <clears throat> Let me give you a quick rundown on this pistol. This is a steel slide on a steel frame, firing a steel barrel. This is a military sidearm, so if you look at it up against a high power, it's about the same size. If you look at it up against a 1911, it's about the same size. Um, it fires out of an eight round box magazine. You can leave one in the tube. It is a single action firearm. But this one is a little bit unique because it's one of the first firearms used by the military to have a decocker. Now we know the P38 from the German military would end up incorporating a decocker, but this is a P35, which means it predated it by about three years. Now this is going to have some military sights, which means it's going to leave a lot to be desired, but my Femru M37 is a little bit worse, so it could be worse. Um, this has a grip safety and no manual safety. It has a phosphate finish, and it has pressed wood grips with the name of the factory, Fabrica Bronis initials on one side, and the name of the model on the other side, which is Viz, which is Latin for power. On the slide, you're going to have FB for Fabrica Broni. You're going to have... Let's get that back in focus. Radom Viz 35. Then you're going to have the patent number, which is 15567. A little bit of history about this pistol. This pistol, uh, or the adoption of this pistol. So, the Polish nation had not been a nation for many, many decades. Uh, they had been conquered or taken over for generations by the Russians, by the Germans, by about anybody else. After World War I, they got their nation back. And the problem is, is that for generations, the countries that took them over did not want them to have the capability to make firearms, do a lot of the different things that most nations just do. And so when they got their independence after the end of World War I, they didn't have the capability of producing their own small arms, large arms, or doing a lot of other things. So they went to the Walmart of military at the time in Europe, and that was Fabrique Nationale. And they said, we like your BAR. We'd like to get a little bit of those rifles here. And as you come over, why don't you see if you've got any small arms? And they gave them some things about caliber size, about how quickly they needed them, about how much they needed to weigh. And the gun that FN had at the time was the 1910 slash 22, which was actually made for the Yugoslavian military, which was primarily made in 32, but could be calibered up for 380. And when they went out for their pistol trials in the 1920s, FN went ahead and brought out the 1910-1922, but then went and brought out the newest model of this that they had available, which this was requested for by the French military. It was requested to be a 9mm. It was requested to be a double stack magazine. It was requested to have a manual safety. It was requested to have a magazine disconnect safety. And we would know of this firearm today as the high power. Now, in the 1920s when they brought this, this is not what they had. But it gives you an idea of what was brought to them. And the Poles, being the good, proud people they are, and the good gun-loving people that they are, they took a look at this firearm and they said, man, let's just fire it. And they're like, man, we kind of like that. It doesn't, it doesn't hit all the things that we've requested, but man, it's kind of better than what we've... Uh, what what we've been given. And so they decided that they were going to do another pistol trial a few years later. And again, the CZ-24 came out. The FN brought their 1910-22. And they just went ahead and brought out another newer version of this high power. And the Poles were, were sold on it. And they said, nope, this is the firearm for us. 
So they went ahead and put this under contract. And due to a lot of different problems with salesmanship, with um, deadlines being met, and, and a lot of other things, the relationship between FN and the Polish military just fell apart. And they decided, you know what? We are good, amazing young uh, people. We can make our own firearms. We have this factory called Fabrica Broni in Radom, and we're going to make our own. And so they went to uh, their their best designers and said, let's make a gun as good as this for ourselves. The problem is uh, you can't unsee this. This is a great firearm to this day. People are spending, you know, hundreds upon hundreds, hundreds of dollars, close to thousands of dollars to own one of these. So obviously, John Moses Browning did a really good job of making this firearm. The problem is, um, patent law does exist, and you can't just copy this. So they said, well, what's another good firearm? They said, well, John Moses Browning made this one as well. This is a 1911. Now, my version right here is a Kongsberg Colt, and I actually have a video up on that. You can go ahead and look at my channel and see a little bit about this gun. But the 1911 was an amazing firearm. I mean, to this day, there are still militaries that, that um, use this as their manual of arms. And they said, well, we can't have this, we can't have this, but maybe we can take the best of this, and the best of this, and maybe make a little something for ourselves. So they looked at the 1911 and they said, what is good about this gun? And part of what the Poles wanted was a cavalry arms. So if you put a, a high power in your hand, especially if you are from that era, this is a thick, large firearm. And you can get a good grip on it, but you can't get a great purchase on this firearm uh, if you're going to plan on riding this, uh, or if you're planning on going to carry this and fire this on a horse, this purchase just feels a lot better. This is designed to be a one-handed firearm, and it does really good. So they said, let's take the single-stack nature of this firearm, and we're going to put that in our firearm. That ergonomics is just going to feel great. Not to mention the fact this thumb safety on this high power, kind of hard to engage. And it's not really tactile. Where the safety on this uh, 1911, that grip safety, that's really good. Because when I'm on a horse, I can go and point that and shoot that. And when I need to put that in the holster and I let go of it, that's a dead gun. I like that grip safety. Also, let's face it. The 1911 is probably the most famous for... It's yoked trigger, which goes around the magazine and engages directly on the mainspring, which causes it to have one of the best triggers ever known to man. And that makes this a amazing firearm. So if you look at the high power, this is a pivoting trigger. I'll double check for all you guys. See, look, there's nothing in the chamber. This is a pivoting trigger which means that it comes up and around before it engages, which means it is not as crisp of a trigger. Not to mention the fact this was designed for the French, and the French said one of the things we want is a magazine disconnect safety, which means this trigger is not a particularly good trigger. So we're going to go ahead and take that yoke trigger, and we're going to put that in our gun. Now, let's be honest, the 1911 is not perfect. If you look at this 1911, it is great when you're firing them bullets. But when you have to disassemble this, especially in the field, you got to push it on this, you got to move a bushing out of the way, you got to move a slide back, align this little tiny notch up against this little notch, get things out. I've got four or five pieces just running around everywhere. Not ideal. The high power is just about as ideal as you can get. So all you have to do is line up this notch with this safety and then pull out this lever look at that that's about as easy as it gets right now the poles are proud people and they have good engineers 
that can come up with some good ideas on their own. And they decided themselves, well, we can improve on some of that stuff. And so they came up with a very similar deal. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I wish I could tell you that on my special education teacher salary, that I could afford multiple World War II Viz firearms, but I can't. I'll be honest with you. I'm currently working driver's education this summer to support my wife's debilitating bow habit to keep all those little baby buckets in their pretty, pretty bows. So we're going to have to pretend that this is an early model, that it has the lever here, the lever here, and that there's a lever here. And just like this high power, this lever over here engages this slot cut or this, sorry, this cut in the slide. And the original ones of these had that in there. Now, after the Germans invaded and after the war happened, they, they cut out that cut and they took out this lever. Now, they came up with a workaround, and that workaround was just go ahead and drop the uh, decocker and it'll work out. So they had designed a telescoping guide rod right here. And that's actually what holds this in. Now, whether you had the third lever or whether you have the just use the decocker, it works the same way. So all you have to do is turn the gun over, hold it good and tight, and pull on this. And you will hear a little tingy tingy because that came right out. This is the one piece you have to worry about. You go ahead. And now you've got your slide disassembled. Now, because this is a captured recoil spring, you're going to need to go ahead and jiggle this thing a little bit to the right, which you'll see there's two little wings right here to the right. And then you just go jiggle, 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 jiggle. Comes right out. Go get that off the lugs. You got a slide and you got a barrel. Do, 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 do. And I'm going to try to get this in focus, and it may not get in focus. If you look, there is a Waffenop, which is a little eagle over a W, lowercase a, uppercase a, 623. And that's right here. Now, my barrel's a little bit old. It's a little bit worn. It's got a little bit of scuff marks. But if you look at this barrel, it looks a lot like the inside barrel, that high power. So they didn't take everything from the 1911. They didn't take everything from the high power. But they tried to take the best of both worlds. And I think they did a really pretty good job. So remember that Waffenop, and that's WAA623. And if you notice on both sides, we're not going to see a 77 anywhere on there. So we got this good barrel. And just to make the UGD happy, look, there's even some rifling on the inside of that barrel. And we're going to reassemble this. Now, this is going to reassemble just like a high power, except for this telescoping um, captured recoil spring. We're going to want to head and go ahead and put it with the wings to the right. Get a little jiggle. Turn that 90 degrees. Now, mine's an older gun, and it likes to give me some grief sometimes. So we're going to try to get it to go on the first try. And if not, yep, I'm going to have to give it a little jiggle off the camera. Sorry, fellas. And we're going to go ahead and rack that back. Put it here. Now, this is a piece of history. So I'm going to be very, very careful to not mar the finish any more than it already is. So what I've found is <clears throat> I'm better pulling with my right. So I'm going to take my left hand. I'm going to put this in here. And I'm just really holding this in place more than anything else. So if you can see, I'm just holding it in place. Then I'm going to go hold, head a hold of that and let that drop into place. It's in there. Now that was a whole lot smoother than a 1911. So those poles did a really, really good job of coming up with some great, great design features that make this gun a little bit easier to function in the field. Now, if you look at this gun, we have, I actually have an original, and again, I'm having a hard time focusing. There we go. Uh, magazine. This is a WAA-189. Now, because this is an original war magazine, 
Uh, some of it has been crimped and pinched a little bit, so I have to wiggle it a little bit, but it'll go in. And what I'm going to do to just keep the springs original to the gun, I'm going to push in this button, and it'll just go right in. Just double check. It'll tap. We got a last uh, round hold open. And this gun right here is a wonderful example of the Viz 35, or as the Germans called it, the P-35P. So that's a little bit of a rundown of the gun. Now, why I like this gun and what makes this gun special to me is the history that it comes along with, with the Polish people, with the military, with World War II. So when the Germans came in in 1939, they took a whole bunch of the parts and they realized that the Polish people were proud people and that they were not going to submit. And so they went ahead and they um, took all the parts and took them to the Steyr factory. And they figured out how to put these guns together. Now there's a little bit of confusion, there's a little bit of question on what exactly Steyr did and what exactly uh, the Radom factory did. And I'm going to refer to the factory as the Radom factory from here on out. Not just Fabrica Broni, but as the Radom factory. And if you see, and we'll see if we can get it up here close, there is a little Eagle 77. Now that is the mark they put at the Radom factory. You'll see there's one there, there's one there. But if we get over here, and it's hard to see on this one, but that is an WAA623, which means that was in Steyr. So they trusted the Polish people so little because they knew that the Polish people would fight being invaded and taken over so much that this is the only factory that they built the pieces at the factory and then assembled them somewhere else. And actually they have found uh, German records that show that the Polish factory at Radom was the worst factory they had about their employees either stealing pieces uh, in their lunch pails or smuggling them out. There's really interesting stories about them hiding them in, in, in metal storage and then having people use chicken wire to put them in their wheel wells. But they were so known for that that they actually would not fit the barrels to the guns in Radom or Radom. And the Polish people didn't care. They would smuggle them out anyway, any way that they could. And, and so they actually got the people at the beginning of the inspection line to watch them put the serial numbers on them. And they would make a duplicate serial number every piece. And then they would, they would smuggle them out. And they had to have somebody at the end of the line as well just to ignore the fact that the same number went by twice. And the Polish people were so proud they could, they could do that. Now... When they smuggled them out, they gave them to different organizations. Like the, the, the for one example, is a Sosna. And Sosna was a uh, freedom fighting group that uh, would take some of these pistols and would check for German um, information, German troop movements. They would be involved in assassinations, anything to help the war effort for the Poles. And um, on one of the emission, one of the missions, September nineteenth, nineteen forty-two, they had a firefight, and of the six soldiers, five of them got away, but two of these pistols were left behind, and one of their serial numbers over here had not been washed, and one of them had not been cleared off completely, and through the records, they could find out uh, a lot of information about. Um, the Sosna and about the people at the Radom factory that were helping them out. And actually on the evening of September 24th into the 25th, the Gestapo came in and arrested 40 members of the staff of the Radom plant. And um, the Germans decided that they were going to teach them a lesson. And that lesson was to have some very, very public 
executions by hanging. They did it in front of the factory. They did it in front of the train station. Um, they killed family members. There's uh, records of a 16-year-old son of somebody that was hung very, very publicly. And yet, in 1943, they were still manufacturing their own barrels to put in the slides and the frames of these guns just to continue to fight the war effort against the invading Germans to the point where they actually created a special um, stamp on these guns, which mine has. And it's it's hard to re- read out the numbers, but there is another Waffenamt that says 77, which meant at the beginning of the process, there was a Waffenamt, and at the end of the process, there was a Waffenamt, just to verify that none of these were sneaking out. The German people after hundreds upon hundreds were summarily executed, hung in front of their family, in front of their friends, still continued to fight the war effort. And this is an example of a gun that through every little mark, every little machine mark, every little nick shows the the pride of the Polish people and how much they wanted to... um, hold on to their Polish pride. And as a descendant of a Polish Jewish person, even though I'm a proud Christian right now, I cherish this firearm. I cherish what it represents. And it's not the prettiest firearm and it's not the most valuable firearm I I own. Um, And with these sights, it's not the most accurate firearm I own. But it's a very, very special one. I'm going to be very proud to pass this on to my daughters. Um, another story that's pretty unique is, is that uh, Heinrich Himmler wanted to remove all the Jews from Poland. And the Radom factory uh, said, no, we need them. They're, they're important to us. And they probably did it for the wrong reasons. But they employed 1,200 Jews at any given time. And at the end of the war, whether they had been mistreated or whether or not it was for the right reasons, those Jews that got to defy Heinrich Himmler and stay alive and work to make some of these pistols was a pretty special deal. Um, And one of those Polish Jews could be one of my relatives. And I think that they would be happy to know that I have this firearm in my hand. And that's why this one is so special. Not so pretty, uh, not so valuable, but so special to me. So I hope you guys liked what I brought to you today. If you did, go ahead and hit that like button. Um, Leave some comments below. Maybe you see another firearm you'd like to see. Uh, Maybe you have a suggestion for a future video. Go ahead, that. Go ahead, hit the notifications. I also am going to post some really, really good information that I got. I couldn't tell you everything about this pistol and, and the Viz 35. Also, I just created a new Twitter account. Don't have anything up yet, but if you want to go ahead and follow the bucket, go ahead and check that link in the description below. And again, thank you guys for supporting. The bucket shall not be infringed.